Are you taking biology? Do you need a quick refresher in genetics and molecular genetics? Well, for the next hour, we're going to go through all the steps of genetics and molecular genetics so that you will be up and ready to prepare for the AP exam that's coming in, oh gosh, 39 days. Uh, so without further ado, let me get the PowerPoint pulled up for us so we can get rolling. So I am Tiffany Jones and I run AP Biology Penguins. Um, so that is an Instagram page where I do daily review, as well as I have a website, apbiopenguins.weebo.com. So if you're looking for a lot of resources as you kind of get to this last little bit of your studying, be sure to check out um, AP Bio Penguins. <laughs> um, so today uh, you're probably wondering, well, why do I call y'all penguins? Uh, well, number one, because penguins are dressed for success. And so as penguins, you are now dressed for success. Um, so today we're going to go through a couple different things. We'll talk about inheritance patterns, so all the genetic stuff. We'll talk about molecular genetics. So that's like replication, transcription, translation, you know, all that fun stuff. We'll do our operons, we'll do a little bit of biotech, and then I have some practice questions built in, and then we'll have a little Q&A, so if there's any questions you have. Now, speaking about questions, there is a slight delay between when I say something and when you hear it slash see my screen. Um, so I've got someone in the chat for you. I've got Melanie Kingett, um, who's actually from the Absolute Recap. And so just a real quick, cause she's doing me a favor by being my chat Q and A. Um, if you have any friends that are taking chemistry uh, or physics or of course biology or government or music theory, she has a podcast that um, will really help you to review for your AP exam. So uh, be sure to just pass her name along. Uh, the absolute recap. Um, and so if you have any questions as we're going through this, just type them in the chat and she will be happy to help you with anything that you need. Um, so first thing, inheritance patterns. It's our quick little thing on genetics. Um, so there's a couple different types of dominance. Well, before we kind of think about dominance, just because something's dominant doesn't mean that it's prevalent, doesn't mean that it's the common trait. So for example, five fingers. Five fingers is actually a recessive trait. Having five fingers is recessive. Um, and so um, the dominant trait would actually be something called poly polydactyly, where there's an extra finger or more than six, um, actually more than five. Um, so that's actually the dominant trait. But if you look around, most people have five fingers. Um, and that's just because of the fact that through natural selection, through um, selective, uh, selective yeah. sexual selection, we're now at, you know, five fingers. So uh, complete dominance. It deals with where you have the uh, dominant allele is going to mask or cover up the recessive allele. This could mean that the uh, allele codes for a protein um, that is seen, or maybe the recessive doesn't make a protein or it has a non-functional protein. So you only see that dominant trait. So whenever we don't have the, the dominant trait there, you of course see that recessive trait because you have the non-functional gene or you have that no protein name. Um, and so with complete dominance, we see the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous will look the same. Um, and so with that, that means that at least having one of those dominant alleles will create enough of that protein that you get the desired phenotype from it. We also have co-dominance. Co-dominance is where you don't really have one that's more dominant over the other. So you'll see them both at the same time. So the heterozygous is going to have both traits. Um, so you can kind of see in this diagram right here that if you had the B, the B allele, you're blue, and if you had the Y allele, you're yellow. And so this individual has both the blue and the yellow um, because they have both the B and the Y alleles. Um, and then incomplete dominance, this would be where the heterozygous is going to be a blend or a combination. So as we said before, having the B allele gives you blue, having the Y allele gives you yellow. And so if you have both a B and a Y, then you have green because it's just blue and yellow mixed together. Um, and so we see co-dominance a lot of times with blood typing. So if you think about blood types, there's A blood type and B blood type. So if someone has AB blood, it just means they have both the A allele and the B allele. So you see both of those glycoproteins on the membrane for the red blood cell. Incomplete dominance, we usually see that example with snapdragons because there's a red flower, a white flower, and a pink flower. So oftentimes you're going to see monohybrid crosses or dihybrid crosses on the exam. Monohybrid just involves that we're looking at a heterozygous at one trait. Um, and so it's important to know some of these ratios off the top of your head, just so that you're able to quickly get through the math. So if we're looking at complete dominance, the ratio is gonna be a three to one ratio, where we have three that are going to show the dominant allele, um, and one will show the recessive allele. So one is homozygous dominant, two is heterozygous, and then of course one is homozygous recessive. So that gives you a three to one. 
If we're looking at incomplete dominance or co-dominance, we'll see a one to two to one, because again, you have homozygous dominance, heterozygous, and then two will be hetero, yeah. One will be homozygous dominant, one will be homozygous recessive, and two are the heterozygous in the middle. So you have two that will show that co-dominant or will show that incomplete dominant trait. If we're looking at dihybrids, that means that we have two different alleles that we're looking at, and your heterozygous for both of those alleles. So if we're looking at complete dominance, it's nine to three to three to one. If we're looking at incomplete or co-dominance, it's a six to three to three to one, I mean, to two to one to one. Uh, so basically we're just looking at a big, long, complicated of the same exact thing. It's just kind of just extended. So you may be thinking, well, how do I do this math and where do this, all these probabilities come from? So if I was crossing this, monohybrid, right? And so I believe when you're doing dihybrid crosses, you always do a monohybrid cross and multiply. Use your probabilities as much as possible. So here we see that I have a monohybrid cross. So you've got the one that's homozygous dominant, two that are heterozygous, and one that's homozygous recessive. So three-fourths of them will be yellow, one-fourth are going to be green. If we did the same cross looking at round versus smooth, again, two heterozygotes, um, one will be homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, one homozygous recessive. Um, and so we'll see that there'll be three fourths around and one fourth are wrinkled, which I said it was smooth and round. I'm sorry. Um, so if I wanted to know with the dihybrid cross, what do I do? You'll multiply these numbers together. So if I want to know yellow and round, I do three fourths times three fourths, which gives me nine sixteenths. And if I wanted to know yellow and wrinkled, I do three fourths times one fourth, and it'll give me three sixteenths. Green and round. Uh, one fourth times three fourths gives me three sixteenths. And then if I wanted green and wrinkled, that's one fourth times one fourth, which gives me one sixteenth. So now these questions can be given to you in multiple different ways. They could be giving you a chi square question and asking you to solve the chi square. They could give you this question where they're asking you what's the probability of a certain trait coming out. They could ask you the number of individuals that you're going to find. Um, so if they tell you that there's a hundred individuals um, that are you know, this certain trait, how many total individuals were there? Or if there's a certain number of offspring we had, how many of them are this trait? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that they can ask these questions. Um, okay, so we're there. And Melanie's doing a great job in the chat. Thank you, Melanie, I appreciate you so much. Um, so when we think about these inheritance patterns, they can either be autosomal or they can be sex linked. So if we're looking at autosomal, that means that it's an allele that's located on a normal, like a regular autosome or a non-sex chromosome. Um, so if you remember, there are 22 um, pairs of autosomes and then there's one pair of sex chromosomes and that gives you your total 46 chromosomes. Um, and so an autosomal trait means that it's just going to be on one of those autosomes. Versus if it's a sex linked trait, it means it's gonna be located on a sex chromosome. Traditionally, it's gonna be on the X chromosome. So if you need help remembering sex linked, just remember that there's an X in sex, and it's usually gonna be on the X chromosome. Um, I've never seen a Y linked trait on the AP exam, um, but they do exist. And if we do see a Y linked trait, it's gonna probably be straight down the board looking at males because males are going to be the ones that have that Y chromosome. And we are speaking about males assigned at birth. Um, so if you have the X and the Y, then you're assigned male. And then if you have two Xs, you're assigned female. Um, so maternal inheritance has to do with that, if you remember, mitochondria and chloroplasts both have uh, DNA. And so the egg is what's going to have the organelles that create the organelle for your zygote. Um, and so if we see a maternal inheritance, this has to do with that the trait is gonna be on one of the chromosomes in the mitochondria or the chloroplast. So it's going to be inherited straight through the mother. So if the mother has the trait, then all the children will get that trait. You won't see it skipping from any of the, the children because it will go to all of them. And then there's just regular linked traits. If it's on the same chromosome, then we're gonna see that they'll be linked. Um, so we're not going to see our normal ratio. So we wouldn't see a nine to three to three one ratio. Um, usually when they show linked traits on the exam, they're looking at um, a heterozygote and a test cross. So we cross with a um, homozygous recessive. Um, and so if we're looking at a, a dihybrid cross with a double um, recessive, then you would expect a one to one to one to one ratio with that. And so if you don't see that ratio, that's telling you that the traits are linked that there are more than 50 NAP units apart. The reason why we do see a little bit of um, recombinance that is because of the, um, the crossover that takes place during meiosis. So what they'll do is they can give you a pedigree. 
And from this pedigree, you've got to be able to figure out what kind of inheritance this is. So if you look here, you can see that the shaded um, traits mean that they have that trait. If it's an open uh, circle or square, it means that they don't have the trait. Squares are males, circles are females, and of course that's male and female assigned at birth. Um, and so when you look here, you can see that these two don't have it and none of their children have it. And if you look right here, you can see these two don't have the trait, but their children do. That right there tells you there's gotta be some type of recessive. So if the trait is able to skip generations, you see there's gotta be a recessive trait because it can be masked or hidden in some way, shape or form, okay? Um, and so if you look here, you can also tell that it's going to be um, autosomal because of the fact that uh, here we can see, I have lost where it was, there's a female that has it that the child doesn't have it. Um, I don't remember where I found it, but there's, this one's gonna be autosomal recessive. Um, here, we're looking at that I've got in every single generation, right? Actually, I messed up again, didn't I? No, I didn't, okay. Um, so here we see that we've got an affected female and all of the males are affected from that female. And so that right there tells you that we're looking at sex length recessive because of the fact that you've got the trait and it's passed on. Um, the reason why I circled this box is because I wanna show you how that female was able to get it because the female, the only way for her to be affected is if she has it coming from her mother and her father versus on this one, it was the males getting the X chromosome from their mother. Um, so the only thing that the father passes on is that Y chromosome. Um, so of course, in order for us to know that this is sex linked recessive, the um, female passed on that X chromosome to the males. And since they don't have a second X, you would see that trait. Here we see um, autosomal dominant. Um, and the reason why we see it is because it's in every single generation. Um, and then you're able to see that it has to do with an autosomal dominant because of the fact that um, the trait is being passed on for every single one. And then we don't, we see equal probabilities between males and females. This is a little more complicated. So here we see that all the ones that come from an affected male, they have unaffected children. But even that come from an affected female, all of the offspring are affected. So that right there tells us that it is mitochondrial inheritance or maternal inheritance. It could be a chloroplast depending on whether we're looking at a plant or an animal. Whew, that's the genetics component of today. So now we're gonna move into central dog. Land. And yes, I'm moving kind of fast. There's a lot to talk about in unit six. Um, and so I want to try to make sure that I can stay within my one hour. Um, and so if you have any questions, just throw those into the chat. Melanie is going to help you out because she loves you and she loves me and she's going to do this for me. So thanks. <laughs> um, so with DNA, okay, so whenever I go through central volume, right, if I'm making more DNA, that's called replication. If I go from DNA and I'm making RNA, that's transcription. If I go from RNA to a polypeptide, that's translation. Now, Marco has some information for us. So Marco says that retroviruses are going to use reverse transcriptase to synthesize DNA from their RNA genome. So this is important to know. Retroviruses have an RNA genome. And what they can do is they can use this enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and they can violate the central dogma, and they can go from RNA backwards to DNA and make themselves a DNA template that can then be used. Oftentimes, this will happen like with HIV and it will insert itself into your genome as a provirus. And so every time you make copies of that cell, you make copies of the virus, which is how HIV is so sneaky. So let's first start with replication. Now I've built a lot of animations in here to try to help us to visibly see what's happening. So things might look a little funky, but I'm doing my best to try to make sure that it works well for you. So first thing, where is replication going to take place? In a eukaryote, it takes place in the nucleus. In a prokaryote, it takes place in the nucleoid. And so if you don't remember prokaryotes, prokaryotes don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. They just have this region called the nucleoid, which is where their DNA is housed, just kind of chilling down the side of all. And so when we move forward into those later phases, you'll start to see that as you start doing one phase, you can start doing another thing. So as we're transcribing, we're able to translate. Um, and it's because there's no membrane separating these processes, okay? So structure. And a eukaryote, the DNA, there's multiple different um, strands of your DNA, and they're linear, so they're long strands. But in a prokaryote, they're going to have a single circular piece of DNA. Now, fun fact, and it's actually in the CED, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes have plasmids. Now, plasmids we'll see in a little bit when we talk about the transformation, but these are just small little itty-bitty pieces of, cell, of circular data, um, DNA that we could use to um, transform different bacteria, or you can use cells. Um, the research I found show that they're in um, yeast, and those are the eukaryotic cells that we find them in, um, but they do have them in eukaryotes as well as prokaryotes, they have plasmids. 
So a couple of reminders about DNA. DNA is made up of nitrogen spaces, okay? So you're gonna have one nitrogen space in each of the nucleotides. So it's either gonna be an adenine, a thymine, a cytosine, or a guanine. You're also going to have a pentose sugar. Since we're in DNA, that's deoxyribose. And it's also going to have a phosphate. If you look up here, you can see we've got our phosphate, we've got our sugar, and we have our nitrogen spaces. And so you should see a whole bunch of the A, C, C's, and G's going through the whole line. Now, two of them are gonna be purines. Adenines and guanines will be purines. Ways to remember that, you've got pure silver. Um, so purine, A, G. And so those are going to have a double ring. Um, and so when you look at the nitrogen structure, there's actually just two rings that are bonded together. So they're kind of wider than the others. Pyrimidines are going to be your cytosines and your thymines. Those are going to have a single ring structure. And so um, when we see the base pairing, we see that we always have a purine and a pyrimidine bonded together. You always have adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. Fun thing that you really need to know is the number of bonds that we have between them. Adenine and thymine will have two bonds, Cytosine and guanine will have three bonds. Way to remember this is cytosine is the third letter of the alphabet. And thymine is needing to make two lines to make a T. Um, so if that's a way to help you remember that adenine and thymine have two bonds and cytosine and guanine have three. Um, and so when we do this base pairing, since we have a purine and pyrimidine together, it makes a uniform width so that we will have the same width of our DNA going downwards. And there is a sidedness to this. So you're going to have a five prime end and a three prime end. The five prime end is where we'll see that phosphate. So you see we have this little five prime ring here because it's on the fifth carbon, there's a phosphate. And then our three prime end, you're gonna see that we have a hydroxyl group. It's the hydroxyl group that's part of the sugar, but it's still a hydroxyl group. So we always remember poo, like, you know, P to OH. Um, so there's a directionality to this. DNA is anti-parallel. So if you look up here, you can see that I have a three prime end and a five prime end and across from every five is a three across from the three is a five, because these two strands are equidistant apart, but they move in two different directions. So they're anti-parallel. So when you're reading DNA, you're always going to read it three prime to five prime. But when you synthesize DNA, you're going to make it five prime to three prime, because as we read this top strand, I'm going to base pair up with it so that I can make my new strand. And when I make that new strand, is going to have the five prime across from three prime because they're anti-parallel. Now that's a tricky subject for a lot of students. So just make sure you know it. You're reading it three to five and you're making it five to three. So the first thing that happens with our replication is that we're going to have helicase come in and helicase is going to unzip that strand. So as we saw right here, my two strands were together and then helicase came in and unzipped it, right? So it broke the hydrogen bond. Now it's not gonna break the entire strand at once. It only is gonna break like little segments of it. And then we'll replicate a little bit and then we'll open up another segment. So the job of helicase is to unwind that DNA strand. Um, another enzyme to know is top isomerase downstream. I don't have an animation for this. Downstream is going to uh, relieve the strain. So if you think about like a shoestring, right? And you twist the shoestring up and then you pull the strands apart. You're gonna notice it deeper down on your shoe, um, the laces. It's gonna get super cool. It's gonna get really tight that's gonna break our DNA and that's a problem. So top isomerase is gonna relieve that strain by basically breaking the, the hydrogen bond, unraveling a little bit and then popping it back together. Um, so that way we won't have any damage to our DNA. So as I said before, helicase is only gonna unzip a little region. So here you see I've un unzipped this little first region right here, okay? Now primase is gonna come in and primase is gonna synthesize an RNA primer. We need an RNA primer because DNA polymerase, the enzyme that does this whole process of replication of making a DNA polymer, right? Remember, enzymes tell you what to do. DNA polymerase makes a DNA polymer. Primase is going to make an RNA primer for us. So what it does is it's going to base pair up, right? The first primase comes in and the primase is going to attach that guanine to that cytosine we see up here. And it's going to attach this guanine to this cytosine down here, okay? So that way we are synthesizing. Now remember, you have to go in two different directions because here is the three prime end to read. And here right here is a three prime to read. You can only make it five to three. So we're then going to keep on going. The primase is going to add the adenine in. Then it's going to add the cytosine on the bottom strand and it adds the guanine on the top strand. And then it adds a uracil on the top strand and the bottom strand. Okay, so all we're doing is base pairing through this whole process. We make this short little fragment, this short little primer. And now that we have something to build off of, now we have the ability for DNA polymerase to come in. So DNA polymerase then makes that other strand. Another job that DNA polymerase will do is it can replace this primer 
with the original strain, like it was not original strain, but it replaces it with DNA afterwards. Okay. And I'm only doing that real quick because I wanted to be able to kind of show you and I've only got like so much room on my slide. Okay. So as I said before, the DNA polymerase keeps going from that primer and then another DNA polymerase afterward can go back and replace those um, RNAs with DNA. Now notice they're going in two different directions. This is this leading and lagging strand that you may have heard it about in your class. Okay. So one of the strands is going to be moving toward that replication fork. Okay. So I'll go back until you can see the animation. So the one that's going towards the fork, that's your leading strand. And the one that goes away from the fork is going to be your lagging strand. Okay. So now we have to open up the strand a little bit more. So again, helicase comes in, it opens the strand a little bit more. I've got the original strands that I've already made, right? And I've already got something to build off of. So DNA polymerase just comes in and finishes making that strand, right? So again, we pop back. We have to have a little primer happening over here again, but I didn't have enough space for that. And so you can see the directionality of this. Here's my leading strand moving into my replication fork. Here's my lagging strand moving away from my replication fork, okay? And then there's a problem. There's this hole right here. Because I've had these two different fragments, these are Okasaki fragments that we'll see on my lagging strands. Because of these Okasaki fragments, that's a problem. There's these little fragments of DNA. So ligase is going to come in and it's going to seal that bond. So now I'll have two complete strands. <laughs> um, and so I cut it down to the single one. So now we can move into transpiration. Um, and I see y'all are doing a great job in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Melanie. Um, I hope that everything's going okay. I'm going to keep on rolling because I'm already short on time. <laughs> so the transcription. We said transcription is where we have the RNA is going to... Um, be, used, be made from looking at the DNA strands. So this is my DNA. First thing I need to do is, of course, I'm gonna to have to unzip it. But I have a little bit of background information first. So with the location, uh, eukaryotes, this will take place in the nucleus and prokaryotes, this will take place in the nucleoid. As a reminder, the nucleoid is going to be within the cytosol because it's just this region of the cytosol. And so since there's nothing separating the um, RNA from the ribosome, as soon as you go through transcription in a prokaryote, you're able to start going through translation. So reminders, I definitely have a typo there. This should be RNA, not DNA. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, so RNA is made up of adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Um, the pentose sugar we'll see is ribose instead of deoxyribose. There is a phosphate group attached to it. So the big differences are between DNA and RNA is instead of thymine, I have uracil instead of um, a uh, Deoxyribose, I have a ribose. Um, traditionally, DNA is double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded. Um, those are kind of like the big points that are different between them. Um, again, talking about your purines and your pyrimidines, now we see that uracil is one of those pyrimidines that we're going to see. Um, and then with our bonding, adenine and thymine or uracil will have two. And then cytosine guanine has the three hydrogen bonds. There is, again, the cytiness for them. We will read the DNA three to five, and we will synthesize our RNA five prime to three prime. Okay. So now, it's important to know which one is our template strand. Okay, so your template strand can be used by different names, right? So it can either be called your non-coding strand, it can be called your minus strand, or it can be called your anti-sense strand, or it can be called your template strand, okay? All four of those words are in the CED, okay? They're in the curriculum your teachers use to teach you, as well as they're in the curriculum the question writers use to make the questions. So it is important to know those four words are the same thing. They mean the strand that you're going to read in order to make your RNA. And so you know that it's the template strand because it is a three prime to five prime strand. Okay, so that's our template strand. This top strand right here is going to be my template or my anti-sense or my miss, minus sense, or it's going to be my, my non-coding strand. Okay, so DNA, I'm sorry, RNA polymerase is going to come through and it opens it up. When it does that, it then can also start to do its base pairing, right? So as RNA polymerase goes through, it's going to base pair up. It does not need a primer because it's able to build off of nothing, as we saw with the primase. Um, and so all we do is the base pairing. The only difference you would see here is that instead of it being a thymine, we see a adenine. So this is something that they can also trip you up on in terms of multiple choice questions. When you see a multiple choice question and they're asking you about RNA and you see a whole bunch of thymines in it, you know that's not the right answer because you know that RNA does not have thymine in it. So that's a way you can start to eliminate some of your answer choices. The same applies for DNA. If they're asking you about DNA and you see a whole bunch of uracils in the answer choices, that one's not right because it is no uracil in DNA. So we also have specific locations. So the promoter region is going to be where the RNA polymerase is going to bind in order to start that transcription. And then we also have these little things called transcription factors. They are going to turn on and turn off the 
the gene. Basically, um, they allow for a tighter hold for the RNA polymerase. I always think of it like a baseball glove, right? So if any of you know anything about baseball or if you watch baseball, theoretically, although our big pro baseball players don't follow this rule, when the ball goes into your glove, you're supposed to take your other hand and cover it up. Right. So number one, you have a glove that kind of helps to give a nice secure fit, as well as you have your second hand that will come in and bind. Right. So that helps to make sure that the ball, aka RNA polymerase, does not fall off of the DNA or the ball doesn't fall out of your glove. Um, and so that's what those transcription factors do is they help to create and they act in a nice little secure hold for the RNA polymerase to bind so it can then start reading with no trouble. So in our post transcriptional modifications that so we've already made as RNA. Now we got to modify it, right? Before it can leave the nucleus, we're going to see that we have a five prime guanine cap, okay? And of course, Melanie, if you can't answer something, I can totally answer stuff when I get to the Q&A at the end, or if any student wants to wait to ask questions at the end, that's perfectly fine. Um, so five prime cap is going to go at the five prime end. The job is number one, to tell the ribosome where to bind to start transcription, sorry, translation. Um, it's also going to facilitate the leaving of your um, RNA from your nucleus. Now this modification only will take place in eukaryotes. We will not see this post-transcriptional modification taking place in prokaryotes because transcription translation takes place in the same plot, in the same location, they're both in the same So this process only takes place in eukaryotes. So we see the five prime cap allows for the leaving from the nucleus. It also allows the ribosome to know where to find. We can also see that we cut out introns. There's these little regions that are just in between, they're non-coding regions, and we can cut those regions out. We cut them out, that's just called splicing. And so we see that we have RNA splicing. We can cut these introns out, push together these regions called exons back together. And then you'll have a poly A tail. The poly A tail is going to inhibit the degradation of the um, RNA in our cytosol. So like the, the RNA is needed in order to make the protein. So if your RNA immediately starts decomposing and breaking down, you're not going to make as many proteins. So we have a long poly A tail to kind of protect that RNA to allow us to make enough um, of the protein that we were wanting. We also have something called alternative gene splicing or alternative RNA splicing. This has to do with that you can code different things with introns or you can code out some of your exons in order to make multiple mRNAs from the same DNA strand. Um, and also noticing that the introns are cut out. If a mutation takes place in an intron, it's not going to affect you because of the fact it's cut out. And that's another place where they'll trick you up where they'll say some other type of mutation, but it'll be in an intron or it'll be in a, a non-coded region and thus it will have no effect. So do watch where these mutations are taking place, whether they're in introns or whether they're in exons. So whew, moving into translation. <laughs> so in translation, we have this ribosome, right? And there's two parts of it. You have a large subunit and a small subunit. Our large subunit is going to bind the tRNA. So we have these transfer RNAs that come in. They have an anti-codon that will pair up with our codons in our mRNA. And they carry an amino acid with them. The small subunit is going to bind to the mRNA. Okay, so the mRNA is the strand that we just made in transcription that has the message, the sequence of three um, codes, the codons, will nucleotides you see over here, um, that we'll base pair up with. And then of course, the ribosome is made up of our RNA, which is ribosomal RNA plus protein. So all three of your RNAs are all used in the process of translation. You have your tRNA makes up the, that binds to the large subunit. You have your mRNA that binds to our small subunit and the rRNA makes up the ribosome. This right here is a codon chart. This is the same codon chart that they have used since 2013-ish. Um, I know, like I, I've looked back at all the exams, okay? so. And you can find this on Google, you can find this on all the practice questions that you can find, okay? Um, the way to read this is that you're gonna find the first base and come across that. So if we were looking for, I don't know, CAC, you come across the C and then you're looking for the second base to come down. So we're looking in this little square right here, and we're looking for CAC. So that's gonna be this HIS word, okay? Um, and so that's kind of how you read the code on chart. So location for translation, it's gonna take place in the cytosol or in the rough ER in our eukaryotes, remembering that the rough ER has ribosomes. It will start in the cytosol, but it can move to the rough ER if it gets a signal peptide. In prokaryotes, it's always gonna take place in cytosol because that's all they have. Step to translation. To start translation, you go through the start codon. It's gonna be AUG, which also codes for methionine. Um, AUG, right here. So you see it says right here, met or start. Um, so that is actually an amino acid that codes for the methionine. So important to know that. 
Um, we also will see that we do this base pairing. So between the tRNA and the mRNA, we base pair up. And when they base pair up, it brings the amino, appropriate amino acid in. And then we have the termination, which is going to be either a, I'm sorry, UGA, UAG, or UAA, which are our different stop codons. Now, you do not have to have any of these codons memorized. This whole codon chart is given to you, um, but it's just one of those things that I figured I would tell you what the stop codons were. So here's my attempt at an animation. I'm not guaranteeing anything with this. Um, so here you can see we have our ribosome. I'm going to assume that we're already in the process of, you know, translating. So the first thing that happens is our um, tRNA is going to come in. So the tRNA comes in and it's going to base pair up. So you see that the C pairs up with the G, the U pairs up with the A, and the C pairs up with the G. When that tRNA comes in, it's attached to an amino acid. Okay, and we can look at our codon chart to see that GAG, <laughs> more of a word there, um, is going to bring in the amino acid GLU. Okay, so the whole thing then shifts over. And then that's when we're going to see our next tRNA is going to come in and bind. Okay, so now there's three sites. This is the A site. This is our P site. And over here off screen is our E site. Okay, the A site is where we're going to add the new amino acids. The P site is holding that growing long polypeptide. And the E site is where we're going to see the empty tRNA is going to exit. So we then brought in the source. We just said we added the new tRNA. It brings in the serum. We're going to then make a new bond between the glutamine and the serum. Okay, now we see that this one is empty and now it's going to be able to leave our uh, ribosome. And as we said, we shifted it over. So now it's open to allow for a new tRNA to come in. The tRNA of course brings in another serine. We, base pa we pair up the polypeptide to our uh, serine that's on that uh, tRNA. And then it's going to of course translocate over. We lose the, the one out of the empty, the E site. And now we've reached the stop codon. Stop codon is going to add water, which then breaks apart the whole thing. And now I'm going to have just this polypeptide. That was my best animation I could get. It only took four hours to make. <laughs> so on to mutations. So there's a couple different mutations that can take place. Um, so there's a point mutation, which is going to be at one nucleotide or a single point. Okay. Um, so one nucleotide base pair. And so you can have a silent mutation. With silent mutations, it's going to code for the same amino acid. So this is leucine, and this is also leucine, if you were to look at the codon chart. So you're not going to be able to see a difference in the protein, but there's a difference in the DNA. And so sometimes when they're trying to figure out what's more accurate to determine uh, relatability or evolution, the DNA is going to be more accurate than the protein because of the fact that you can have silent mutations that took place in the DNA that are not seen in the proteins. So another type of mutation we can have is a missense mutation. Missense means that instead of one amino acid, we're coding for a different amino acid. This is what happens with sickle cell disease. It's coding for one, there's one base pair uh, substitution. And because that base pair substitution, that leads us into a different amino acid, which leads to why you have the circle shape versus the crescent shape for the sickle cells um, in low oxygen levels. And then the last type of uh, one we look at is nonsense mutation. Nonsense mutation is going to change from an amino acid to a stop codon. So it could lead to a premature stop. Now, all of these mutations could be helpful, they could be hurtful, or they could have no effect. It all depends on whether it affects the folding of the protein, as well as if it affects the active site. If it affects the active site, there's a big chance it is going to completely change the function of that protein because of the fact that now the substrate is going to be unable to bind to that active site. And same thing as if it's folded incorrectly, it may not be able to do its job or its function. So we also have other point mutations where instead of it being a substitution, now we could be looking at insertions or deletions. If you insert one or two nucleotides, it's going to cause a frame shift mutation. It shifts the grouping of three letters that we read for translation. If it shifts, if it shifts those three letters, then now we're reading the wrong groups of three letters, which can cause a whole bunch of different amino acids to be placed in there, which makes a completely different protein. Um, so that's considered a frame shift. Um, if it's in a group of three, it's not going to have too much of an effect unless it's in the active site, because groups of three will keep your, uh, your, your reading frame the same. Um, so we won't see as big of a change there. We can also have chromosomal mutations. Chromosomal mutations deal with where we've either modified the chromosome in some way, whether we've rearranged the different chromosome parts, so there's been inversion or insertion, or we're looking at that we've changed our chromosome number. 
Okay, so rearrangement, that would be like an assertion. So if we inserted a sequence in there, if you've deleted entire sequences, um, so like coup de gras involves the deletion of a huge gene from the end of one of the chromosomes that leads to the coup de gras. Um, you can have duplication, that's Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is involved in that you have a duplication of a certain gene too many times and because it's duplicated too many times, it leads to that Huntington's disease. You get an inversion, the trait is pulled out, flipped over and popped back in, or the gene, I'm sorry. Um, and then you can have translocation. You can have a gene that uh, codes from one chromosome. It can translocate and move on to another chromosome. So those are like the big changes that we're going to see in the chromosome. Okay. So we're not talking about like a single nucleotide being deleted or like small segments. We're talking about like big chunks of DNA that's getting cut out, delete, um, cut, deleted, inserted, moved around, flipped around, duplicated. Like that's what we're seeing here. Now, if we look at chromosome number changes, that would be like if you have non-disjunction that took place in meiosis. If you had non-disjunction and the chromosomes, of course, bypass the, um, what is it, the M checkpoint, um, and it's able to go into anaphase, even though all the kinetic cores are not attached to the microtubules, no, sorry, the kinetic cores are not attached to all of the chromosomes, then you could end up with an extra chromosome going into one of your eggs or sperm cells, which could lead to an extra chromosome in the, uh, gamete, which leads to an extra chromosome in your um, offspring. That's what happens with Klinefelter's, what happens with Down syndrome, it's what happens in Turner syndrome. Um, so there's all these like chromosomal dish, I think Edward syndrome also. Um, so polyploidy has to do with that all of the chromosomes are duplicated. So um, you end up with some big mutation where they don't actually split and make the gamete. Um, and so now our gamete is diploid instead of being haploid. And so if a haploid cell and a diploid cell come together, now you're triploid, or you could have two diploids come together and make it tetraploid. Um, so that's where we see with polyploidy. That usually takes place in plants, although there is a polyploid little mouse that I've seen in our textbook. Um, this right here, yeah, that's a bad picture. I see what you mean. Um, they're basically looking at the, the strand from the, the um, the coding sequence. Um, so I agree that original DNA is not the best word we could have written. Um, it probably should have said like the original codon. They're trying to show you how this codon was changed. So I agree DNA is probably one of the best words that they could have used in that diagram. Um, so operons, when we move into operons, this is where we see um, our prokaryotes. Okay, so our prokaryotes are gonna have some type of gene regulation that they look into. We've already talked about the gene regulation with um, eukaryotes looking at the activators, the inhibitors, um, and the promoter sequences, and looking at um, the modification you can make with our mRNA, all those are ways you can modify. So within our, our operator, I'm sorry, our operons, we have three different parts. You have a promoter, which is a site where RNA polymerase is going to bind. You have your operator, which is a site where the repressor is going to bind. And then you have the genes, so all the DNA that it controls. The cool thing about prokaryotes is that all of the genes that are needed to be regulated are all placed together. So they're in these little, like, cool little segments, which are called operons, okay? There's two types of operons you can have. There's a repressible operon and there's an inducible operon. With a repressible operon, the example we use is a trip operon. Um, so the job of the trip operon is it's going to synthesize tryptophan as an amino acid. This uh, trip operon is found in E. coli that is in your intestines. And so as you eat food, as you break down that food, you then of course have these tryptophan amino acids in your gut. And so the E. coli traditionally is just going to use your tryptophan. Why would it need to make some when you already give it to it, okay? So it starts out um, being on where it's going to make the tryptophan, right? Where our oppressor is inactive. But if you have tryptophan that you're giving to the E. coli, why does it need to make it? So the trip is gonna bind to the repressor, which is then going to activate that repressor. And so since your repressor is active, it's going to bind to the operator. So since it binds to the operator, it's kind of like this big rock that was placed in the middle of the RNA right? Or a railroad track or whatever you want to say, right? So now RNA polymerase cannot bind because there's this repressor in its way. And so because of the fact that the repressor is on, the operon is off. I will say that one more time because I know that it's complicated. So if tryptophan is present, the tryptophan will bind to the repressor, putting the tryptophan, um, sorry, the repressor onto the operator to inhibit RNA polymerase from binding. So since RNA polymerase can't bind, you're not going to be able to make the um, mRNA from it. So now we look at our inducible operon. The inducible operon, an example we see, is LAC operon. The job is to synthesize the enzymes to break down lactose. You don't need to break down the lactose if you don't have any lactose present. 
So it starts out being in the off position because the repressor is on or activated. So if lactose is present, lactose is gonna bind to the repressor. By binding to the repressor, it is going to inactivate your repressor. So the repressor falls off of the operator. And so now RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and can synthesize the enzymes needed to break down lactose. So if you notice the repressible operon is going to get turned off, it starts on and it gets off, though so it's repressed, it's turned off. Versus the inducible operon is going to be off, it's going to be induced or turned on. And yeah, I realize that that is a tricky subject for many students, and I'm sorry, y'all. So biotech, whew, the last topic we have to get through. So there's four different things that are in the CED. You've got gel expresis. Gel expresis is going to separate a molecule based on its size or shape. I'm sorry, yeah, size or charge. Um, so what we see is that there is this little well right here, and you're going to put the DNA, the RNA, the protein into that well, um, and it's going to be at the negative end, or you could put it positive depending on what you're trying to study for, okay? But since DNA is negatively charged, we put it at the negative end, right? You then turn on the electricity, and the DNA, because it's negatively charged, gets attracted toward this positive end, and it gets pulled, right? So you're able to then separate it based on its size because there's these little pores inside of your gel. And so the smaller fragments can move in and out of those pores and kind of weave their way farther down the, the gel plate versus our larger fragments, they get trapped. And so you'll see that our larger fragments will be at the top, our shorter fragments will be at the bottom. If you see a thick band, it means that there's more DNA at that segment, okay? So you can kind of see the amount that you have um, based on that. Whew. Um, I have seen this as examples where like they'll ask you to analyze um, whether the trace a certain individual has. There was been questions on like sickle cell and you had to figure out whether um, the individual has sickle cell um, based on a jelly to breathe. Uh, so polymerase chain reaction is going to be a way that you can amplify or make multiple copies of a certain DNA segment. Um, and so what you do is you first go through and you heat it up so it denatures it and breaks apart the DNA strands. You then cool it down and it adds a primer to it. Um, that primer is, of course, the RNA primer that we needed. And then DNA polymerase will start to build the second strand from that. And so it's allowing within the thermocycler to go through this replication process multiple times to allow us to make multiple copies of that strand. And we have a specific type of uh, DNA polymerase in this. It's a TAC polymerase. It comes from a, a thermophile. It's a bacteria that lives in very hot conditions because this environment, like this machine is going to keep heating up and cooling down. Um, and if you didn't have a way to keep your uh, polymerase stable, then it would denature. So this actually allows your polymerase to stay stable. We also have bacterial transformation. So you can uh, modify a um, plasmid or you can take a certain plasmid of interest and then you can heat shock the bacteria, and then you can insert that plasmid into your bacteria, and then you can grow it on a plate. Um, and so we've seen this uh, probably in your class where you were trying to make antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, you're trying to make it glow green. Some of y'all I think did a, a blue lab where you try to make it blue or green, depending on which proteins it was making. So that's just dealing with transformation. You're seeing if you can transform this bacteria um, and give it characteristics with that plasmid. And last but not least, DNA sequencing, this is a way that we can use radioactive isotopes in order to determine the sequence on a DNA strand. So we're going to code it with those different um, radioactive nucleotides. And we then put in a machine and like based on the little output, this graph, you're gonna be able to determine the different nucleotides that are found at each position so you can sequence the DNA. Yes, I know we're gonna finish in an hour, but I'm gonna do my best. So as before, we have our multiple choice practice that we can do. And so here we see we have a student biology class that's crossed with a male, um, Drosophila, just basically a fruit fly, having a gray body, long wings, with a female that has a black body, A wings. And so we want to look at the distribution. So if you look here, you see we have one parent with 42, the other parent has 41, and then you see we have a recombinants that are nine to eight. If you remember earlier, we talked about that you wanted to have a one to one to one to one ratio when you were doing a uh, test cross, so recessive with a heterozygous. So because of the fact that we don't see these one-to-one -one ratios, we know that these two traits are going to be located close together on the same chromosome. Um, and the only reason why we see some of these traits is due to that crossover. And yeah, I'm going through the practice question a little faster than I usually do, just because I want to make sure that I can finish before we hit the hour. So when DNA replicates, each of our strands is going to be used as a template, right? So this is asking us, which of the following illustrates that enzyme-mediated synthesis of our new strand with a replication port? So earlier we talked about that there was the anti-parallel component to it, right? So if you look here, 
This one, the DNA is being made three to five and is reading at five to three. That's not right. We talked before that you have to read it three to five and you have to make it five to three. So because that top strand, we know this first one is incorrect. Again, we see that we're making it three to five. It may still be making them in fragments, those little Okasaki fragments, but it's still not correct because it's not synthesizing five to three. So here we see that we're doing good, right? We're making it, you know, five to three. No, nope, that's not right. This one's also going the wrong direction. So this one is three to five, again, going in the wrong direction. So here we have, of course, the only one that is right. So we are making it five to three. And then again, we're making them five to three, five to three, five to three, because we have our Okasaki fragment. So our answer is that bottom one. And you could probably go with which of these is not like the other. Look, every single one of these top strands is all going in the same way. So you kind of have to use a little bit of application there. The so sickle cell anemia, uh, results from point mutation in HBB genes. The mutation results in the replacement of amino acid hydrophilic R group with a hydrophobic R group on the exterior. Such mutation most likely results in altered. So they're trying to figure out what's going to happen because of this point mutation, right? So will you find abnormal interaction between adjacent hemoglobin molecules? So because of the fact that you have a hydrophobic and hydrophilic substitution, is it going to fold differently? Well, yeah, I probably will. Is the DNA structure going to result from um, hydrogen bonding in our nitrogen phases to be different? No. Is the fatty acid structure for ionic interactions occurring in fatty acid chains? What do fatty acid chains have to do with proteins? They don't. Protein secondary structure results in hydrophobic reactions between the R groups. Secondary is your alpha helix and your beta polluted sheet. R groups is dealing with your tertiary structure, so D is completely wrong. So the only logical answer was A, because of the fact that we switched out that amino acid, which switches out, of course, makes a different shape. And because we have different shapes, they're no longer going to bind together. So last time we did this question in which we were looking at making these different gametes, right? So we said that you we were going to have um, one long, one short for each of them. Of course, it'd be two of the Gs, two of the lowercase Gs, two of the capital Gs, two of the lowercase Gs, Gs, because we were making, of course, our cross. Right. So they want to know to predict the possible phenotype of the ratios in the offspring with the test cross. Right. So we said that our S1 was heterozygous, it's double heterozygous. Right. So if we do that cross, we would expect there to be a one to one ratio between our dominant trait and our recessive trait. Because if you were to cross heterozygote with homozygous recessive, there's a one half chance for your dominant trait and one half chance for your recessive trait. Um, we do the same thing with our other allele, our dwarf allele versus our tall allele. Again, giving us a one half of our dwarf and one half of our tall. If you go ahead and do the math, you can multiply and say, okay, well, one half times one half for green dwarf gives you one fourth. And that same math applies for all four of them, right? So you would expect that if we were following, you know, independent assortment, that we would have one green tall, one green dwarf, one purple dwarf, and one purple tall. Okay. Now it said that you have to predict the possible phenotypes. Remember to write these in complete sentences. Okay. If you don't write in complete sentences, we're not able to give you points because the prop says you got to write in complete sentences. So be sure to make sure that you do write in complete sentences on your FRQ. So it says, okay, if the two genes were linked together, so they're on the same chromosome, they're located close together, how would we find the differences with our phenotypes of the offspring, right? So we should see one to one to one to one ratio or 25% of each of the different phenotypes, 50% being parental, 50% being recombinant. So if the traits were linked together, I would find more parental and less of the recombinant. So you would say that majority or greater than 50% will be parental phenotypes. You could say that greater than 25% would be green dwarf and greater than 25% would be purple salt, basically saying either of the um, parental traits there would be a higher percentage than 25% for each of those. Or you could say the opposite, where there would be less than 25% of each of the recombinant alleles. So there's that practice question. One more practice question in terms of your response, and then we should get to Q&A, and I will have made my hour. So in humans, the genes that particular condition has only two alleles, one of which capital B, completely dominant over the other, lower C. The phenotypes of three generations of family with respect to condition are shown in our pedigree, isn't it beautiful? And the individuals are numbered, okay? So describe the process in eukaryotes that ensures the number of chromosomes will not double from parent to offspring. So if you think about it, okay, wait a minute. We're going, why do I not get more chromosomes when I go from my parent to my offspring? Why do I still have 46 chromosomes? Well, because I go through meiosis. And when I go through meiosis, I'm able to separate those homologous pairs, 
which into my gametes. So I make a haploid gamete. So when two haploid gametes fuse together, they make that diploid. So you did have to talk about that those homologous chromosomes were separating specifically in meiosis one, and that when they separate in meiosis one, it then made it haploid, and that when two haploids come together, they then make it back diploid. And that's why you don't see the duplication, you don't see an increasing of our chromosome number, is because of the fact that we have a haploid gamete. So explain why only one chromosome in individual 16 um, contains a DNA from both of the individuals one and two. So if we look at 16, why can we say that it came from one and two? So this is its grandfather and this is its grandmother, right? So knowing that these two individuals made the homologous pair that get passed on to its father, right? So because of that, one of those is going to get passed on to the offspring, right? Um, and so because of the fact that you could see um, crossing over from those, um, you could see that you would get a combination of the chromosome from individual one and the chromosome from individual two. They could have crossed over, which would have made the one chromosome that this father donated in his sperm to our individual 16. Now notice that these are a little bit kind of expensive. You got to think through a little bit. Um, question five on the AP exam is going to be a kind of, just going to give you a explained bio and then it's going to apply to a specific concept and then you're going to have to draw something. So step three is going to, I'm sorry, part C is going to make you draw. So using this fig template, we need to figure out um, what are the genotypes for individuals 2, 4, 8, and 18, right? So if we look here, we can see that this one is going to be our um, homozygous in some way. And then there's, of course, our heterozygous. And so we know that this is going to be um, autosomal recessive. Um, you can tell that right here because these two are recessive and they pass on that trait. Um, I'm sorry, these two are, do not have the trait and they're passing it on. So we know that this must be autosomal recessive. Um, so in order for this individual to have had offspring with the trait, we know that they have to be heterozygous because they must have passed on the recessive allele, while this one had, of course, homozygous recessive to pass on to this offspring that has the trait. Uh, because of the fact that number four also has a child that is affected, we know that number four is also heterozygous. Over here, we see that they have the trait, so we know they're homozygous recessive. And then right here, when we're looking at this, since this one's homozygous recessive, um, and this one is unaffected, we know this one also is heterozygous. So based on the pedigree, which you had to figure out D in order to figure out C, you need to figure out why it's going to be sex-linked or autosomal because of the fact that we can see here that these two are unaffected and passing it on. We know that it's going to be a recessive trait. And then here we can see that it is going to be um, autosomal because of the fact that you have a female that would be passing on this trait and her male sons are not affected. So there's no way that it is a sex linked trait. So we know that it must be autosomal recessive. And with that, whoo, I finished in under an hour. I don't know how I did it. Um, but so if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. I can help you out. Um, while we're waiting on that, because I know that it takes a little second for that to happen. Um, I want to go ahead and show you AP Bio Penguins. Um, so on here, there's a lot of different stuff you can use. So there's my TikTok review. So I did a bunch of TikTok little quick review sessions for you. I've got game codes. I've got FRQ Fridays from last year. I'm planning on maybe doing the FRQs from last year's exam as little FRQ Fridays as we get closer to the exam. All my marker learning sessions are on there. The daily review that I post on Instagram is on there. Um, so there is a ton of stuff that you can use that can kind of help you. So does anyone have any questions? Anybody? Okay. Um, so I don't see any questions showing up in the chat. I do want to remind you to make sure that you are following um, all of our social media. So of course, you need to be following Marco Learning on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, which of course you're following them on YouTube because you're watching me right now. Um, also make sure that you are following um, me on Instagram and TikTok. I don't know about the TikTok, those videos are kind of cringy, but whatever. Um, and then make sure that you're following the Absolute Recap on uh, Instagram as well as TikTok. She has a great stuff, as I mentioned before. She's got biology, she's got chemistry, she's got physics, she's got government, she's got um, music theory. Um, so all of those would be great resources to help you. So make sure you're following all of that. Um, I do see there is a question in the chat. It says that the quizzes codes are full. They're actually not full. Quizzes is rebellious sometimes. And I contacted them and they told me that you just need to refresh your browser and clear your cookies. Um, and I'm currently typing up all the questions and putting them into a Word document so that you'll be able to access them, even if the website decides to be rebellious. 
And so with that, since I don't see there's any questions in the chat anymore, I'm gonna go ahead and say, I hope y'all have a wonderful day. Remember your AP Bio pen